talk very much about children and those who are helpless. Yes. Um, how would you see an objectivist society handling the case of, say, a small family, the parents are killed in an accident, those children uh, perhaps don't have any other relatives? What's to be done? How, how, would, you, how would you fund their care? Um, so the children and their poor, so we get another yes. way. Yes. <laughs> Well, no, it's single family. If they were poor, they could be helpless. These are children. Yes. Now, look, children, uh, children uh, have, uh, you know, their parents, in a sense, hold their rights um, in, um, yeah, in a trust, in a sense. Uh, children don't have, they don't em embody the full rights because they're not fully rational. Sense. They're not capable of dealing with the world, and parents, that's their responsibility. The responsibility is, is uh, to help them get to the point where they are, you know, where they're adults and they, they take care of themselves. Um, in a case like that, in an objective society, I have no doubt that a charitable entity would come in and help those kids uh, and take care of them. I, I think it would ultimately be up to private charities to take care of the poor of the helpless. You know, you can imagine somebody born of part of a plea You know, just can't take care of themselves. Then it's their family that'll take care of them, or it'll be a charity that'll take care of them. What isn't legitimate, what isn't legitimate is that I be forced to take care of them. I can be approached and, you know, I can be reasoned with, I can be, you know, people can ask me to help them, but they have no right to pull out a gun and force me. As soon as you have government doing that, then you're basically the only role the government is against to defend individual rights. If the parents are abusing the kids, then government has a role to step in and stop that abuse because the rights are being violated. The trust that the parents are holding is being violated. Um, but if the parent, if, they, if the kids run away from home, if they're just poor, if they're just that is an issue for charity. It's not an issue. I'm supposing. And they couldn't get charity, yeah. and nobody would help them. Yes. Then they would die. They would die. And they would die. But I don't think that would happen. I don't think there's any evidence in in uh, in American history, which is which is the, which, or even in in the history of you know other places that have approached freedom. I mean, everybody's just approached it; they've never attained it. You know, even in a place like Hong Kong, as brutal of a place it is, as poor of a place it was, at least for some people, but free. People were dying in the streets. People were taken care of. They were charities, even in the, in, the, in the poorest of places. There was no welfare state in Hong Kong for, for, for many, many years. And yet people, by the millions, by, by the hundreds of thousands at least, emigrated in, right? People weren't escaping to get the welfare of other countries. People were coming in. I mean, that's, that to me should indicate something, that every free country in the history, to the extent that they are free, People want to move there. People are not clamoring. I mean, some people want to come into the welfare state, but people certainly are not clamoring. We're clamoring to go to the Soviet Union. People aren't clamoring to go to North Korea. They want emigrating to Europe. I mean, that's, there's an indication of, of, of a legitimate country and an illegitimate country. It's just a proxy. The degree to which people want to move there. I mean, people want to go to Japan, even though the Japanese won't let them in. People want to go to South Korea. They just won't live. I mean, people want to come to America. They want to come to the UK. They don't want to go to North Korea. They don't want to go to Iraq. Arabs want to come to Israel. They don't want to go to the West Bank. They don't want to go to Jordan. But if, if Israel opened up its job market to Arabs from all over the Middle East, it could attract millions and millions of Arabs to come and work in Israel. Because Arabs in Israel are freer than they are in any other country in the Middle East. And indeed, and this has nothing to do with our topic today, but indeed, just a historical fact, uh, between 1890 and 1948, when the State of Israel was established, the, the Palestinian, so-called Palestinian, the Arab population of Israel grew dramatically. Not because of birth rates, but because of in-migration from Syria, from Lebanon, from Jordan, and from Egypt, and from Iraq, and from everywhere. Why? Because those nasty Jews were building industries, they were building businesses, 
They were building roads. They were creating civilization. They were creating activity. And all these Arabs wanted jobs. So they came. So all the Palestinian problem, the so-called Palestinian problem that exists today, is all the fault of the Jews for building up a semi-free country to begin with. Because those Palestinians could have been slaves in Syria and you know, Jordan and anywhere else today, and they wouldn't be so-called refugees in, in Palestine. But capitalism, freedom, individualism creates prosperity. And, and so prosperity, again, is a, pro, is a proxy for freedom. Uh, and where people are do it poor, I can guarantee you they're also unfree. And you can, it is a direct correlation. Go uh, travel a little bit around the world that you can see. You done? Yes, sir. Thank you.